It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, Speaker, my question for the Premier. In the case of the teachers' strikes in Peel, Durham and Sudbury, the fact that 72,000 students, high school students, were severely impacted had absolutely no effect on this government. Settlement talks were sporadic at best. The education minister seemed thoroughly confused. The reality is these students are back into class today because of the Ontario Labour Relations Board's decision, not because of any positive action taken by this government. Now 800,000 elementary students are going to be held hostage unless this government gets serious about reaching a settlement. Premier, is 800,000 a big enough number for you to finally get serious about doing your job and negotiating a settlement with the elementary school teachers? Question, thank you. Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, and I, I want to uh, say how pleased I am this morning that uh, the students in Durham and in Rainbow and in Peel are back in school today. I want to thank the uh, Labour Relations Board for pointing out uh, what we've said all along, which is that central strikes need to be about central issues and that local strikes, which is what this was, should be about local issues and that the uh, Labour Relations Board did in fact confirm what I've said all along and that this was in fact an unlawful uh, strike in the sense that it was local but based on central issues. And and I, 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 I do want to thank the uh, Labour Relations yes, Board for uh, their ruling because, had it not been for the OLRB thank you. ruling, the. Thank you. Supplementary. The member from Simcoe North. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this question is to the Speaker as well, to the Premier as well, Mr. Speaker. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario will wrap up their work uh, to rule job action on June the 1st. Uh, teachers will no longer uh, make themselves available to meet with parents to discuss students' transition to the next grade. Field trips for the next school year will not be booked. Teachers will not participate in professional development activities. Premier, you've been preaching to us in this House for weeks about your commitment to negotiated settlements. But now we hear that you've not, you're, you're not even at the table with the Elementary Teachers Federation trying to negotiate a settlement. Premier, where is your sense of urgency? When are you going to get back to the negotiating table and end the chaos you've created in Ontario's education system? Yes, sir. Yes, and I think this issue of a sense of urgency is really important because we had a sense of urgency that we uh, needed to uh, go to the Education Relations Commission, uh, get the uh, ruling that the school year was in jeopardy, tabled back to work legislation. The kids could have been back in work, uh, back in school even earlier in the week had it not been for the NDP blocking the legislation. Order. But I would like to thank the three school boards who got the, uh, the cease and desist order very late in the day yesterday. I would like to thank the three school boards for working very hard yesterday evening to make sure that the school board uh, actually have students back in, the, back in the classroom today. So thank you to the boards for thank that. You. Speaker, you know, she hasn't answered either one of the questions. So, and so back to the Premier. The job action announced by the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario will have an immediate impact on students. Special needs students will suffer because teachers will no longer make themselves available to talk about students' transition to the next grade. Field trips for the next school year won't be booked. Premier Education Minister has had over a year to negotiate collective agreements with all of these unions. In that time, she has made absolutely no progress, and it is a stupid. Two different conversations going on other than the person putting the question, including members from that side as well. It stops. Uh, whoever said that's close to getting turf too. I'm standing. Please carry on. Premier, it is the students that are suffering and their parents. Premier, you've, you've got three months left until the beginning of September the 1st when, when the kids go back to school. And we, have, we know we have chaos now. Premier, will you fire this education minister and put someone competent in there who can get the job done and end the anxiety for Ontario's parents and students? Thank you. Stop the clock, please. You see it, please? 
Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. As the member just pointed out, we have three months left to negotiate with ETFO, and we will do that. But we only have 10 days left to make sure that now the students are back in class, they stay in class. That's right. And that's why we that's need key. to go ahead and work our protect pass our Protecting the School Year Act, is to make sure that those students who are back in class today stay in Remember class the for the Carlton. rest of the school year. And that is exactly what we intend to do, is make sure as our top priority that we get our legislation passed so that the kids who have gone back today can stay there and benefit from teaching for the next month and get their school Answer. year completed and graduate for those who are in grade 12. That Thank is you. our priority. Question the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you. Uh, back to the uh, Premier, Mr. Speaker. When the uh, Ombudsman uh, released his report on the building practices uh, of Hydro One, the findings were astonishing and astounding, to say the least. Mistreatment, abuse, deceit, and deception, just a few of the words that described Hydro One's business practice as outlined in the Ombudsman's report. For now, Hydro One is a Crown Corporation for which the Minister of Energy is ultimately responsible. It appears no one was held accountable for the findings of the Ombudsman's, Ombudsman's report. Premier, will you hold the minister responsible? Will you fire your Minister of Energy for his complete incompetence on this file, apologize to the tens of thousands of Ontario Hydro One customers who were misled, Question. apologize to the officers of this House who were deceived and lied to, and put a new minister in place that we can have confidence in? The, uh, good check. The, um, the member from Hamilton Mountain needs to be reminded that you're even a little closer now, and I can hear you. And so, with that, with that, I will also ask the deputy house leader that when I'm standing, stop. And I'm going to put the. Uh, the new rule that I've been working with, that if I'm standing and you want to chirp, you're gone. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to again thank the Ombudsman for his report and for his recommendations. And we've acknowledged that during the transition to the new billing system, Mr. Speaker, there was an unacceptable number of uh, mistakes, that uh, there were too many customers who experienced uh, service issues, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, um, the CEO of uh, Hydro One has apologized to all customers. And prior to the review by the Ombudsman, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One had begun to make changes. So there was already an acknowledgement that there was a problem and there were changes put in place. Having said that, we're, uh, we're pleased that the Ombudsman has uh, done the review and there are more recommendations that have come forward. But, Mr. Speaker, I hope that the uh, Leader of the Opposition is, uh, is aware of the fact that as we talk about broadening the ownership Answer. of Hydro One, one of the things that needs to happen is it needs to be a better run company, Mr. Speaker, and I think that, uh, I think that this latest incident makes that very clear. Supplementary. I don't think, back to the Premier, Mr. Speaker, I don't think selling Hydro One is going to give you the oversight and the accountability that you should be exercising today. In fact, you'll lose majority control, you'll lose oversight, no more ombudsman, no more freedom of information, and we won't even know because you won't put this before the Parliamentary Budget Office or the auditor prior to signing the deals with your new private sector partners whether or not we're getting a good deal or not for the people of Ontario who own that company that's been given away in a fire sale. Shame on you. What are you going to have somebody take responsibility for the billing errors of Hydro One for the months and months? that they deceived the officers of this legislature, that they deceived the members of this legislature, impeded our ability to serve our constituents properly because we didn't have honest and direct information. No one seems to ever take responsibility in your government. No one at Hydro One has been dismissed. I ask you again today, at least Thank dismiss you. the minister. Show that you care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Start the clock. Premier. 
much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I am so pleased that the Leader of the uh, Opposition raised the issue of a fire sale, Mr. Speaker, because it is the fire sale of the 407 that was the fire sale. That was so close. And I don't say that with a smile. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition knows full well we are retaining 40 per cent of the He knows that the regulatory controls that are in place now are going to continue to be in, in place. He knows that the setting of prices, that uh, the process that is in place now will continue to be in place, Mr. Speaker. He knows that we will have control over the, uh, the appointment of the CEO. So, Mr. Speaker, I Member think from that Trinity, the Leader of the Third Party needs to understand that the way the 407 was sold off, with no ongoing revenue to the people of Ontario, with no control over that Answer. board, Mr. Speaker, 100%. and an undervaluation of that asset, Mr. Speaker. That's the backdrop against Thank which you. we made decisions, and we did it different. Thank you. Final supplementary, the member from Hunter, Nicholson, Humber. You know, when the Liberals are in a mess, they dodge, deflect, and deny. That's their modus operandi. But they fail to answer the question and fail to, be, fail to be accountable to the people of Ontario. Back to the Premier. On December 17, 2013, the Minister of Energy's office wrote to Hydro One New CEO asking about the absurdly high number of complaints about Hydro One service. The CEO responded that everything was good, Remember from Barry. the level of complaints was nothing to be concerned about. Mm, it's only he told the Minister of Energy's office that despite senior officials at Hydro One referring to the organization as being in crisis mode over the level of complaints. Premier, has the CEO of Hydro One been held accountable for lying to the Minister's office? No. 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 Angie. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, we know that Hydro One has been working hard to resolve outstanding issues, Mr. Speaker, and Hydro One has outlined that work in detail. However, further work and remediation is still clearly required, Mr. Speaker, and that's why I've asked the chair of Hydro One, David Dennison, to report back to me within 40 days with a detailed action describing how Hydro One can further address the recommendations in the, re in the uh, Ombudsman's report, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but what we need to say is that this government has provided more additional oversight than any other government in the history of this province. Mr. Speaker, we created the position of Financial Accountability Officer, made the French Language Services Commissioner independent, put into place the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth, allocated new power services for, for children and youth, Mr. Speaker. Sir? Expanded the ombudsman's role, Mr. Speaker. Expanded the ombudsman's role to include oversight of municipalities, school boards, and publicly funded you. universities. You take no lessons from those people. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On Tuesday, the Minister of Education stood in her place and said, I quote, the act that we will be introducing this afternoon is obviously designed to get kids back into the classroom. We want kids back in the classroom as quickly as possible. Well, kids are back in the classroom. Why is the Premier stopping a strike that isn't even happening when instead she should be stopping the chaos in the schools? Well, Mr. Speaker, yes, the kids are back in the classroom. They could have been back in the classroom two days ago, Mr. Speaker, if it hadn't been for the, uh, for the NDP. important that we uh, that we make sure that those students stay in the classroom till the end of the uh, the end of the year as the minister of education has outlined mr speaker there's no guarantee that uh, that would be the case and so we need to continue to uh, work to put the legislation in place so that there will be a guarantee that the students in those three boards in rainbow and in durham and in um, what's the third one peel and peel that they are uh, that they are in school for the duration of the school year, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Speaker, on Tuesday, the Premier said, quote, Speaker, we want those kids back in school. We want the collective bargaining process to continue. Yeah. In 2013, the Premier said her style is 
collaborative, which is leading from within a team, bringing people to the table. End quote. In 2014, she wrote to her Labour minister and told him to quote, uphold and respect collective bargaining process and maintain a respectful labour relations climate. The strike is over, Speaker. The kids are back in school. It's time for this Premier to keep her word, respect the process, bring the people to the table, and get an agreement with the teachers. Will this Premier stop making things worse by continuing with Bill 103 and instead end Western. the chaos by spending the next little while at the negotiating table trying to get a collective agreement? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. The member from Essex is inches away. I'd like an acknowledgement from the member from Essex that I spoke to him. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much. And uh, I, th I think we actually need to look at the ruling from the OLRB. What the OLRB has directed is I direct that these strikes cease for at least two weeks from the date of this decision. In other words, Speaker, the strikes can resume with different signs on June the 10th. Now, if the leader of the, uh, of the from NBC Kitchener, Waterloo. would actually read the legislation, she would discover that the legislation not only brings people back into school, it keeps them there for the rest of the year. There will be no more strikes in Durham, no more strikes in Peel, no more strikes in Rainbow for the rest of the year. We need to pass the legislation yes, so the kids stay in school. Final the Liberal government takes no responsibility whatsoever for the chaos that's happening in our schools. Right. It's because they're refusing to bargain at the bargaining table that we're in this mess in the first place. They lost kids six weeks of their education because they are not being serious in terms of their obligation to bargain. But you know what? Apparently, the Premier doesn't have any confidence in her minister to get a deal, which is why she's using her majority to stop a strike that isn't even happening, Speaker. The only way we can get stability is with a deal. But instead of bringing people together, the Liberals are driving the sides further apart and inflaming an already very Order. bad situation, Speaker. Will this Premier pull her bill and focus on getting an agreement that will end the uncertainty Question. and the chaos in our education system, Speaker? Thank you. Minister. I find it quite appalling that the leader of the party opposite, first of all, wanted to maintain and continue what has turned out to be an unlawful strike. Now she doesn't want to make sure that the strike doesn't want to resume in two weeks. We want to keep the kids in the strike, keep the kids out of. Please finish. And, Speaker, it's also important to note that the legislation from before the House actually sets up a scheme to continue negotiations, to uh, have mediation, and if neither negotiations or mediation are successful. Wrap up sentence, please. The, uh, so the bill actually does ensure that negotiations, mediation, and if necessary, arbitration take place, and Thank that's you. what exactly what. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Questions for this uh, premier speaker. On October 20th, the premier stood in her place and said, "Ed Clark quote." has said quite clearly that he doesn't believe that selling those assets is the right answer. He has said that. I believe that the leader of the third party is probably having a bit of a hard time framing the question because, in fact, Ed Clark has said he agrees that selling those assets is not the right answer thing to do. Wow. End quote. Now, six months later, here we are, Speaker, and the Premier is selling off Hydro One. How can the Premier say people knew that her, what her plan was, because she keeps saying that, 
Everybody knew what her plan was, apparently. But not only did she not run on that plan, but she spent months after the election denying that plan, and even Question. the Clark had no plan to do this a couple of months ago. Where's this, uh, the, the Premier coming from, Speaker? Member from Eglinton Lawrence, come to order. Let me, let me. Sorry. Member from Eglinton Lawrence, come to order. Premier. Mr. Speaker, let me uh, once again go through um, what we are proposing to do and uh, what was in um, Ed Clark's final report, which is that we need. To, well, I know you're talking about the interim report, but there was a final report, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and the and the recommendations in the final report are the are the Order. recommendations that we are going to implement, which mean that. I would ask that the leader of the third party listen to the answer of the question that you put. Carry on. In order to be able to make the investments in infrastructure, in transportation infrastructure, roads and bridges and transit, Mr. Speaker, in order to be able the member to from do Renfrew, that, come to order. in order to be able to make those Second investments, time. Mr. Speaker, we are broadening the ownership of Hydro One. We are retaining 40% ownership, Mr. Speaker. No individual or entity will be able to own more than 10%, Mr. Speaker. The regulatory controls and price controls will remain in place, Mr. Speaker. And the sir, ability, sure the ability of uh, the government to determine where a line will be built, Mr. Speaker, will remain in place. Those controls were very important to us, Thank as you. well as the retention of. Thank you. Supplementary. On October 27th, the Minister of Finance said, and I quote, We have made it clear that we are not going to sell off our assets. Here we are, six months later, and the Premier is selling off Hydro One. One of these things is not like the other, Speaker. It seems not only did the Premier keep Ontarians in the dark about her plan to sell off Hydro One, but it seems she kept her Minister of Finance in the dark as well. well How can the Premier say people actually knew about her plan as of October when, as of October 27, even her own Minister of Finance had no idea? Mr. Speaker, we said that we were going to review the assets owned by the people of Ontario in order to be able to invest in we the new. A trillion truck. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. Finish, please. In order to be able to invest in the assets and the infrastructure that are needed for the 21st century, Mr. Speaker, that's what we ran on. That's what we said we were going to do. We said we were going to ask Ed Clark to give us advice. He did that, and that's what that, those recommendations are the recommendations that we're going to in, invest in, Mr. Speaker. We're going to implement. And I would ask the leader of the third party which projects that we are implementing would she would she cancel, Mr. Speaker? Would she cancel the Hamilton LRT? Would she cancel? Cancel the expansion Answer. of Highway 7, Mr. Speaker, to Kitchener Waterloo. Would she cancel the Edmonton Crosstown? Would she cancel the. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, in October of last year, the Premier stood here, and I stood here, and the Premier said to me, quote, it must actually be very hard for the leader of the third party to ask these questions. She knows we're not selling off the assets. She knows perfectly well that that was one of the parameters as Ed Clark went into this review. She knows that we are keeping the assets in public hands." End quote. Well, here we are. Here we are. The Premier is selling Hydro One. But six months ago, she looked at me in this chamber. She looked at me in the eye, and she said she was not selling off our assets. So, how can the Premier, how can the Premier of this province say that she has been up Front with Ontarians, let alone this legislature, Speaker. Question. When six short months ago she insisted that Hydro One was not going to be sold. Thank you. You it, please. You it, please. Thank you. I would say to the leader of the third party today that it must be equally hard for her to ask questions that she knows perfectly well undermine a plan to invest in the people of this province, to invest in the infrastructure of this province, to invest in the
do it because she has no plan to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. And apparently, I'm standing. Finish, please. Apparently, Mr. Speaker, she thinks it's just fine to step back and say we don't need to make investments in infrastructure. We don't need to build the roads and the bridges and the transit in her own hometown that are so vitally necessary for the future economic health of this province. She thinks that's fine. We don't, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan to build that infrastructure, and we're going to. The, uh, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, second time. New question. The member for Renfrew, Nipson, Pembroke. Yeah. I'm still here. Uh, to uh, the Premier. The Ombudsman report said that they learned from internal emails that Hydro One deliberately sanitized the script it used at that meeting with the Ombudsman. A Hydro One official wrote in an email, if we simply state that we are essentially in line with expected customer reaction, that's a healthy story. That official was deliberately misleading an independent officer of the legislature, and they tried to hide the truth. Premier, has the Hydro One official been fired for misleading and obstructing the ombudsman? Oh, yes. Minister of Energy. Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, we know that the ombudsman did a very comprehensive and thorough study of this particular issue, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have accepted his report, Mr. Speaker. Um, and uh, we, uh, we've also um, uh, we're proceeding on the basis of having asked the current chair, David Dennison of Hydro One, to follow up on the Ombudsman's report, to report back publicly, Mr. Speaker, within 40 days, uh, looking into all of the uh, recommendations, as well as any other relevant matters around the billing issue, Mr. Speaker. We will have a thorough report from the current chair. We will assess the situation at that particular time, Mr. Speaker. There were three senior officers, Mr. Speaker, of the corporation who were associated with the IT system, who are now no longer with the corporation. They Answer. left the corporation, Mr. Speaker around the time that the, the uh, extent of the, uh, the billing errors uh, came to light, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Again to the Premier. The Ombudsman's office called Hydro One to ask about a billing issue. When that conversation ended, the employee emailed their manager. The manager replied, and I quote, If you get the feeling that they're going to investigate more aggressively or escalate, let us know. And good warning in case they come knocking. Please keep holding the line with messages like you conveyed. It is obvious that the manager knew something wasn't right and instructed their staff to, at the very least, bend the truth or perhaps outright lie. Premier, has that manager been fired for instructing their staff to mislead the ombudsman? Here, here. Minister. Mr. M Mr. Speaker, uh, I just repeat what I said. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I'll just repeat what I said uh, in the uh, in the main question, Mr. Speaker, but. Uh, it's very clear that Hydro One has been working to address the outstanding issues, Mr. Speaker, but we're going further than that. Uh, we want to make it perfectly clear that we're going to be receiving a report from the new chair of Hydro One. Mr. Speaker, and the newly appointed chair of Hydro One, David Dennison, is overseeing a process to select a CEO moving yeah. forward, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, the chair and the Minister of Energy are in the process of restructuring the board of directors, Mr. Speaker. It's going to be a better company. It's going to be a more efficient company, Answer. Mr. Speaker, uh, and it will be a very accountable company. Thank you. Good question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Education Premier. Speaker, the Liberal government. I uh, stop the clock. I'm going to offer some advice, and that is just the title, which is we've done before, and it'll stay that way. The last time it said. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Liberal government's chronic underfunding of education in our province has left our schools in chaos. 
The Minister of Education Order. actually boasts about the fact that she cut $250 million from education over 2014. It goes both ways. Finish, please. The Minister of Education actually boasts about the fact that she cut $250 million from education over 2014-2015. The Minister boasts about the fact that her government has closed 88 good neighbourhood schools. The Minister is proud of her record of cutting $7 million from the Geographic Circumstances Grant, which supports small, rural and isolated boards. All of this and the Minister is Minister of government services. Interest in the education sector. The minister was given a simple task, get a deal with the teachers, and she failed. Speaker, will the premier fire the minister of education Question. immediately? Minister of Education. Sir, education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I think maybe we should start by uh, reminding the members opposite about the plan that they ran on for education oh, yes. and health. Oh, the plan they ran on for education and health said that they'd start with the budget that we had last year and then they would take out $600 million from the budget we had, which would seem to me that might have been about $250 million out of education and about $350 million out of health because health has the bigger budget. So, in fact, their platform was to take $250 million out of the education budget beyond the $22.5 billion that we started with. So I'm uh, quite surprised that this is somehow now a problem, because a year ago, that's what they did. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Speaker, the Minister of Education has been sitting on the sidelines not taking this seriously for weeks. The Minister has been playing the blame game, desperately trying to skirt responsibility for the mess that her government has made in education. The Minister has insulted families and students by saying, I had protests outside my office before the last election, and I seem to have gotten re-elected. Member from Sprint, Trinity it's Spadina. Obvious she's more interested in playing political Second games than getting a deal. The Minister was responsible for getting a deal with teachers, and she has failed, leaving parents and families to pay the price. We have members of CUPE here from the education sector, and she's not taking bargaining with them seriously either. They've been waiting since June. Speaker, will the Premier take responsibility for this mess and fire the Minister of Education? Yeah. My question actually is, when are the NDP going to stop blocking the legislation? Yeah. That enables us to legislation that enables us to make sure that now that the students are back in their classes in Durham, in Peel, in Rainbow, that ensures that they'll stay there. Because the OLRB ruling did issue a cease and desist and get the kids back into class, but it doesn't keep them there. It says a strike can restart on June the 10th. We need to pass the legislation quickly that will ensure that the The member from Essex, second time. The member from Windsor to Wrap up sentence. The legislation that is before the House will ensure that students stay in their classes in those three boards for the rest of the school year. Thank you. Your question, the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am, Para Pan Am Games. On May 30th, in just three days, Mr. Speaker, the Pan Am torch will be arriving in Toronto, where it will begin its 41-day journey. I was excited to learn that on June 2nd, as one of its first stops, the torch will be arriving in my riding of Sudbury. And I know many of my constituents are getting excited to welcome the torch and the Pan Am spirit to Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, and there'll be a celebration in Bell Park. After it leaves Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, the torch will begin the journey across beautiful northern Ontario. Stop the clock. That's enough.
comments I'm hearing are just way over the top. It's not the place for this. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It'll make stops in Thessalon, Blind River, and North Bay, just to name a few of those beautiful places. From the north, the torch will travel around the province until it reaches the opening ceremonies on July 7th. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister. Minister, can you tell us about the torch relay and the journey the Pan Am Flame will Question. make across our great province of Ontario? Wow. Member from Hamilton Mountain, second time. Minister Tur uh, Tourism, Culture, Sport, responsible for Pan Am Pan Am Fair Games. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member uh, for the question. And you know, I'm so excited uh, to uh, to know that the flame is going to arrive here in Ontario uh, this week. There's been so many people involved in the planning of these games, and I think the arrival of the torch really captures the momentum we're building here in Ontario. And as the uh, the member mentioned, the torch will arrive in Toronto on Saturday, and it will travel to northern Ontario this Sunday, landing in the beautiful city of Thunder Bay. And. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that everyone in this province, Mr. Speaker, has an opportunity to participate uh, in these games, and uh, that's why uh, we made sure that there would be 130 sp uh, uh, stops throughout the province, um, and then the opening ceremonies will take place on July 10th. I encourage all members of this legislature to join in in the celebration and to uh, participate at these Answer. 130 locations, and I'll uh, give some more uh, information in the supplemental. Thank you, Minister, and uh, thank you, Speaker. Torchbearers include Canadian icons such as Chris Hatfield, Alex Billado, and Simon Whitfield. They're among over the 3,000 torchbearers who will be carrying the torch during the relay. Citizens from all walks of life will get to be part of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and it's great. So many people will get to participate, Mr. Speaker. And let's not forget, Mr. Speaker, people from around the province will come out to witness this incredible event happening in over 100 communities. Mr. Speaker, I know that all communities are planning unique cultural and sporting events to celebrate their connection to the Games. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the members of this House about how our government is supporting communities in their efforts to celebrate the Games? Question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the member for the question. I'm happy to tell the members of this House about a great program that I had the opportunity to announce in Milton. Tell us. Our government tell has us. developed the Torch Relay Community Grant to support the arrival of the Pan Am, Para Pan Am Flame in local communities. That was a good the deal to Torch uh, Relay Community Grant is part of Ontario's $40 million strategy to ensure everyone in this province has the opportunity to benefit from these games. Funding is being made available to municipalities and band councils undertaking a torch relay community stop or celebration or communities hosting an official torch relay event. This is about supporting diversity, Mr. Speaker. It's about supporting inclusion and accessibility and activities that will build on the excitement of these games, as well as ensuring as many Ontarians get to participate yes, in these incredible games that are coming to Ontario. Thank you. Your question, member from Nipissing. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On January 2, 2012, 18-year-old Tori McIntyre Corville phoned her mom to tell her she loved her and that she'll be home. The next day, Tori and three teenage friends were all killed in a horrific crash in Parry Sound. It appears the roads were not safe for travel, and it took the Auditor General to tell us why. In 2009, to save $36 million, winter road maintenance was drastically reduced. But the public was never told. Ministry officials were not only aware of this, Deputy House Leader, they second time. to senior levels. Premier, you took over as Transport Minister in 2012. What did you know about this major reduction? The uh, Deputy House Leader is warned. Finish, please. Uh, you took over as Transport Minister in 2010. What did you know about this major reduction in safety, and what did you do about it? Mr. Transportation. Mr. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member from Nipissing for uh, for this question. I've, I've had the um, the opportunity to say a number of times here in the legislature that, as Minister of Transportation, whenever I hear of an injury or a fatality on any of Ontario's highways throughout any season uh, over the course of the year, of course I offer my heartfelt condolences and I feel deep sympathy for the family and friends of those that have been impacted. The auditor did come forward with a report. There were. Eight recommendations contained in her report. The Ministry of Transportation has accepted all eight. 
of those recommendations, and I accept, uh, gladly accept the responsibility for making sure that going forward we continue to improve this program so that it provides the people of every corner of this province of Ontario with the kind of highway maintenance that they expect and they deserve. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Barker. Uh, Premier, not only were those four teenagers killed, there were 10 deaths within eight days, all kids under the age of 20. In fact, one was eight years old. You changed the winter maintenance rules and didn't tell anybody about it. You cut back on winter maintenance to save money. You put people's lives at risk, and for five years, you and your government said that that never happened. Everyone up north kept saying something's different, something's not right with our roads. It took the Auditor General to come out and tell us the truth. I first called for a coroner's inquest in 2012. Premier, will you finally do the right thing and ask the coroner to hold an inquest into these terrible deaths? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thanks again, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for the follow-up question. The, um, the, before the auditor was asked to go in and conduct her review back uh, in 2013, the Ministry of Transportation did conduct its own internal, internal review of the winter maintenance program. Speaker, and As a result of that internal review, there's 105 pieces of additional equipment that have been deployed both in southern Ontario but also in northern Ontario, specifically in the north for truck climbing and passing lanes. Speaker. In addition, um, more inspectors were brought to bear in every region of this province to help us with oversight. Speaker, the other aspect of the auditor's report that the member opposite doesn't reference is that she acknowledges that the ministry's moves with respect to improving this program uh, deserve, uh, deserve some recognition. And in, addition, in addition to that, Speaker, it's also important to point out that over the last 13 years, the province of Ontario has consistently ranked first or second in North America yes, for, winter safe, for, for highway safety. And we will continue to work on this program going forward. Thank you very Thank much. You. New question We're from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier: Can the Premier tell Ontarians whether there will be any review of selling off Hydro One to foreign owners? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've uh, been talking about the uh, review of. Uh, a number of assets. Actually, we've been talking about this review since April of 2014 when we brought forward the most progressive budget in Ontario's history that was denied by the opposition, who didn't even show up for lockup, Mr. Speaker. And in it, we discussed a number of initiatives going forward. And we're talking about broad ownership of, uh, of Hydro One at this stage, recognizing that it's about giving opportunities for our retail and certain institutions, but it's broadly spaced in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We'll further discuss it in the months to come. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. So I guess that's a no. Um, the Premier knows. The Premier knows that foreign owners can litigate under NAFTA. They can litigate under the WTO. Independent research from the Legislative Library confirms that any amount of foreign ownership can open the door to litigation. And legal experts confirm investors have the right to sue the government if the government gets in the way of maximizing their profits. And they specifically say, quote, the balance between the public interest and the rights of foreign investors would be tipped decidedly in favour of foreign investors. Why is the Premier handing away control of a strategic asset like Hydro One to foreign investors? Wow. Minister. Mr. Speaker, Hydro One will be one of the uh, biggest uh, companies in Canada. It's going to enable us to have a, a progressive and growing corporation housed right here in Ontario owned by Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, and it's going to enable us to provide even greater increase in dividends and opportunities 
uh, for the public who will be able to have the opportunity to buy into uh, the company. Mr. Speaker, it is about protecting the public interest as well, and we'll continue to do that with the opportunities that will exist, as we do with other major corporations in Canada. We're talking about the first tranche of being only 50 per cent. The public and Ontario will still have 85 per cent of the company this year as we proceed forward to assess the dynamics of what will perhaps yes, occur thereafter, all with the intention of protecting the public interest and, more importantly, Importantly, reinvesting the money into infrastructure to earn even greater value for the province and for Thank the people you. of Ontario. Thank you. Your question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Recently, our government announced that Ontario will be working towards a greenhouse gas emissions reduction target of 37 per cent below 1990 levels by 2030. This ambitious but achievable target keeps our province on track to reach our 2050 target of 80 per cent below 1990 levels. On April 15, the federal government announced a 2030 greenhouse gas reduction target of 30 per cent below 2005 levels, which is equivalent to only 14 per cent below 1990 levels. This is less than half of Ontario's commitment to fighting climate change. Yesterday, the federal government had some difficulty explaining to a House of Commons committee how much Canada would have to reduce its emissions by to reach their 2030 emissions target. Question. Speaker, through you, could the minister please tell the House how many megatons will Ontario need to reduce its emissions by to reach our 2030 emissions Thank target, you. and how we'll reach that? Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is challenging right now. The uh, all of the weight of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in Canada has fallen on the backs of the provinces to do that. Our coal plant closures, uh, amazing programs in Quebec and British Columbia, uh, provinces have stepped up to, to actually reduce emissions. Mr. Speaker, it was disappointing to see that the federal minister couldn't even tell us what the numbers were uh, in their plan. Well, they don't have a plan, Mr. Speaker, which is probably why they can't tell us what the numbers are. Uh, our, 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 uh, our commitment, Mr. Speaker, is consistent with other jurisdictions, which is 37 per cent by 2030. That actually is a 65.5 megaton reduction, which will be one of the most wow. significant. Uh, the introductions of member, uh, yes, uh, initiatives like our carbon market, working with California and Quebec, are the kind of hard practical policies that will actually get us there, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. I'm really pleased to hear that our government's taking the issue of climate change so seriously and has a firm grasp of the reductions we will have to achieve to reach our important greenhouse gas reduction goals. Many constituents in my riding of Cambridge, North Dumfries, and indeed Waterloo Region recognize that climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time and poses a threat to our infrastructure, food supply, drinking water, and our economic competitiveness. Increasingly, provinces and states have stepped up to provide leadership where national governments have failed to take meaningful action on one of the most important issues of our time. This is especially clear when we see the federal government announcing a 2030 GHG emissions reduction target, which amounts to less than half of what Ontario has committed to. Speaker, through you, could the minister Question. inform this House on the ways in which Ontario is working with other jurisdictions to take action on climate change? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you can't just pull numbers out of the air. The reason that we chose 37 per cent is because that's what we're tracking to, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very proud to be part of a government with Premier Wynne that's actually continued to meet our commitments. We met our 2014 target, Mr. Speaker. Our five-year plan said we'd be at 6 per cent by 2014. We know we've met that and may have actually exceeded that. Mr. Speaker, we're now developing our next five-year plan for 15 per cent by 2020. These numbers are important because they have to be sufficient to keep us under two degrees Celsius. And we just—I was just signing the under two MOU with Governor uh, Brown and others, uh, progressive uh, governments. The problem with the federal uh, target of 14 percent below 1990 levels is less than half what's necessary to keep us under two degrees. So it really—it's like putting a Band-Aid on you know, a, a, a heart attack, Mr. Speaker. It just simply doesn't do the job. And the provinces in Canada want to see the Government of Canada there Thank you. in Paris with targets sufficient to keep us under two, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from Kitchener, Conestoga. My question is uh, to the Premier. Premier, this morning in the media studio, 
we heard heartbreaking stories detailing life-changing impacts to the small number of Ontarians suffering from PKU, a rare inherited brain-damaging disorder that can lead to severe intellectual disability without treatment. Premier, every province began testing for PKU in the 1960s, but the families of the few hundred who suffer across Ontario are asking why this province is denying access to one of those only medications available. Extreme restrictive criteria you've set out has meant that two years after being cleared for managed access, not a single patient has received publicly funded access. Premier, do you think it is fair that PKU sufferers are forced to come cap in hand, like so many before them, to plead your government for medication Question. that will change and often save their life? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I greatly appreciate the question from the member opposite. And I uh, also appreciate the fact that uh, John Adams and his colleagues, colleague uh, is here from the association representing those families and individuals who are suffering from PKU, which is a an absolutely devastating uh, disease and illness, Mr. Speaker, particularly if it's not detected very early on in life. Uh, that being said, we uh, it is a challenging uh, process. Uh, to determine uh, which drugs to provide public funding for and which not to, and we rely on our clinical experts. We, in fact, have depoliticized the process so that we get the best possible scientific and clinical evidence to determine whether a specific drug is effective or not. I'm pleased to say that uh, in the, this interim period, because there is a national process underway to review this drug, but through the Accept Answer. Exceptional Access Program, we do, on a limited basis, provide uh, funding for this drug, Kuvan, uh, which is incredibly important in this condition. Premier, people with rare diseases can't wait. Maddie Vanstone couldn't wait. The AHUS sufferers who were here a month ago can't wait as you make feel-good announcements when they're facing you, but continue to force them to jump through hoops for access when they leave the building. It's not right, and you know it. At the end of question period, I will be asking for unanimous consent to introduce a motion to strike a select committee into funding for rare diseases in Ontario Idea. and that the House leaders determine composition of that committee before the end of this calendar year. Premier, will you join me in doing the right thing? Support the creation of a select committee into funding for rare diseases and end the suffering for those forced to plead with you Question. for life-altering medication. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm absolutely certain the member opposite uh, agrees with me that this shouldn't be a process which is politicized. It should be based on the best scientific and clinical evidence possible. Ontario has asked the national process, the Common Drug Review, to revisit this drug, Kuvan, to actually uh, help us establish the clinical criteria that uh, will allow us to provide it to those individuals who will benefit from it. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to say that it has been. This drug was reviewed by the Common Drug Review. Uh, on a national basis. It was not recommended for public funding. Despite that, Ontario and one other jurisdiction, I believe Saskatchewan, went ahead and put it on its exceptional access program. And As I mentioned, we've gone back to the federal process, asked them to review the clinical criteria. In fact, uh, through the conversation I had this morning with the uh, advocates for those suffering from this disease, uh, I will be asking our ministry to review the clinical criteria again. Here, here. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Conversion therapy has caused far too much pain for far too many Ontarians. It needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. And we can do that by passing Bill 77. But the government seems to be stalling, Speaker. The government House leader has asked for a number of government bills to pass before he calls Bill 77. Many of those bills have already passed, Speaker. The remainder are scheduled to pass, and still the government refuses to pass Bill 77. But every day that the Premier forces Bill 77 to sit in limbo is another day that conver conversion therapy is practiced here in the province of Ontario. Why won't the Premier stop the political games, do the right thing, and call Bill 77 to committee and third reading now. Thank you. Premier. 
Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I and this uh, government, uh, this party, we fundamentally believe that patients, that Ontarians deserve the right to be treated with dignity and respect in support of their human rights and defending those human rights. And the leader of the third party knows this well. In fact, the premier of this province spoke herself in this legislature directly in support of the private member's bill that's uh, the coming from the member from Parkdale High, High Park. And I appreciate, we all appreciate the work that the member from High Park, uh, Parkdale High Park is doing on this. It's also important to, uh, to reference the fact that uh, I have had my ministry working hard on this private yeah, member's bill with the member from Parkdale High Park. She met with them last week to go over the legislation, the proposed legislation, the bill itself, to make it yeah, even stronger so that we can all be proud when it comes to that moment in time when we're able to debate it in the legislature and pass it so this yeah. conversion therapy is no longer permitted anywhere in this province. So, yeah. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm now even more confused than I was before. Everybody in this legislature actually supports the bill. in this legislature supports the bill. The Liberals profess over and over again that they think conversion therapy is wrong and it doesn't belong in the province of Ontario. We have an opportunity in these next few days to get through that third reading process, get through the committee process, put those amendments forward that the Minister of Health talks about, and let's get it done. Every day that we wait, another young person is in jeopardy of having their lives ruined from conversion therapy, Speaker. This is a Liberal majority government. They need to take this on. They need to to take it seriously, and if the health minister supports this and knows that there are things that need to change, we can get this done by June 4th, and it's their job to make sure it happens, Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. House Leader. House Leader. Well, Speaker, it is absolutely shameful and disgraceful of the leader of the third party uh, to put the lives of young LGBT kids in jeopardy, Speaker. Because for last three weeks, Speaker, for last three weeks, she is single-handedly obstructing the passage of Bill 77. And I've had many conversations, uh, Speaker, from the member for Parkdale High Park, who shares my view of the obstruction from the leader of the third party. But not only she's obstructing that bill, she's also obstructing from a very good bill from the member from Haldemar Norfolk, Bill 27, and the member from Ottawa Orleans, which is Bill 83, Speaker. Speaker, the three House leaders have been working very closely to make sure that we pass very good Order. private members' bills through this legislature, but Answer. the leader of the third party single-handedly has been obstructing the passage of the Bill 7, and she should be regretful and shameful about that. Start the clock. New question, the member from Beaches East York. Merci, le, Mr. Le Président. Ma question. Thank you very much, Speaker. I have a question for the Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs. As you know, the, the year 2015 is a milestone in the history of our province, the 400th anniversary of the French presence in Ontario. More than ever, this is an opportunity to celebrate the significant role of Francophones in the success of our province since uh, 1615. And Mr. Speaker, would the Minister uh, describe to us uh, how Ontario is investing in uh, Penetanguishan in the context of the commemoration of the 400 years of the Francophone presence in Ontario? Thank you. The Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs. I'm very 
impressed by my uh, uh, colleagues' uh, mastery of uh, French. Uh, our government uh, recently announced uh, an investment of $1.4 million uh, for the redevelopment uh, of uh, uh, a place that has great importance, uh, great historic importance in Ontario, the Penetanguishan Poor Park. Uh, in uh, uh, fact, uh, this is where the meeting between Samuel de Champlain and uh, the chief Huron Wendat uh, occurred. 400 years later, we are proud to participate in efforts to redevelop the Penetanguishing Park. Uh, I would like to thank the, de the uh, member from Simcoe North for his help uh, in uh, bringing the, government, the federal government into this project uh, with, uh, for a contribution equal to our own. I would also like to thank the mayor of Penetang, Jerry Marshall, for his uh, great enthusiasm for this project. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your kind words about uh, my uh, French. I would like to thank the Minister responsible for French Affairs for her answer. We can see that she's very proud, uh, very enthusiastic, and has devoted a great deal of energy uh, to this project. Uh, I'm also happy to see uh, the extent to which the government uh, believes uh, that. Uh, the contribution of uh, First Nations and Francophones is, uh, uh, is, must be commemorated. These are two communities that uh, contributed and continue to contribute to shaping our province and our country. Speaker, I have another question for the Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs. Would the Minister explain to us uh, how this uh, Penetanguishan project uh, came to be. <laughs> Minister, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, such a major project uh, uh, required close collaboration uh, among a number of uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, both at the, uh, munis at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels. I would like in, to think, thank in particular uh, the the uh, Rotary Champlain uh, Wendat uh, uh, Park uh, uh, initiative was first and foremost a citizen initiative. I would like to uh, uh, note uh, the uh, determined leadership of uh, Ms. Uh, Anne Gagné and Mr. David Dupuy, without whom the project never could have been uh, become a reality. Thanks to their tireless uh, efforts uh, for francophone interests, uh, we are leaving a a heritage to the people of Penetanguishin, but to but also to thousands of Ontarians, Canadians, foreign tourists uh, who will be able to come to see this wonderful park and learn more about the uh, francophone history in Ontario. For my question this morning is for the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Minister, a freedom of information request from your ministry states that over $5 million was spent on production and advertising Lies. for the Pan Am Invade ad. That was in 2014. We know that you're now airing a lot more ads, you're producing more ads, you're even putting them on during expensive times, like during the Stanley Cup playoff game last night. We also hear that you've hired a famous director. Good choice. Finish, please. Thank you. We've also heard that you've hired a famous director to film people leaping off the CN Tower for a new ad. We can suggest a few people. I don't want to hear about the flame. I don't want to hear about the medals. I don't want to hear about Patchy. What I do want to know is how much have you actually spent to produce and air advertisements for TO 2015? How much money? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, it's interesting. On uh, on one side of the house, we hear we're not doing enough for advertisement. On the other half, uh, they're saying we're doing too much in advertising. But the one thing I do know, Mr. Speaker, is that they're only days before the torch comes here to Ontario. You know, we have 44 days until we welcome the world to Ontario, and still. The Progressive Conservative Party in the province of Ontario are not on board. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite would know exactly how much we're spending on advertising if you actually showed up for our technical briefings. We've had five of them so far, and I don't think.
think any member from the Progressive Conservatives no. showed up. When will the Progressive Conservative Party stand up for the athletes in the province of Ontario, stand up for this province, and join us as we welcome the world here to Ontario? Uh, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for the other person beside you to sit down so I can uh, identify you. The member from Leeds Grenville on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, my girls' government uh, group that's in the uh, gallery facing and representatives of Girls Inc. of Leeds Grenville. Welcome to Queen's Park. For Kitchener, Thomas Stolga, on a point of order. Yes, Speaker. Um, I would like to seek unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice respecting the establishment of a select committee to research funding for rare diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Member from Kitchener, Thomas Stolga, seeking unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice. Do we agree? I heard a no. A member from Parkdale High Park. Yes, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to introduce Equal Voice for, and thank them for a wonderful breakfast and panel discussion this morning and for, of course, sponsoring Girls' Government Day. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 40, an act to amend the uh, Crop Insurance Act, Ontario, 1996, and to make consequential amendments to other acts. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
the members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. Go slow. On May 25th, Mr. Leo moved third reading of Bill 40. All those in favor, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassick. Ms. Jassick. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Darmerlin. Ms. Darmerlin. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mr. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Tebow. There's, there's a time thing here. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Denova. Ms. Denova. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. <coughs> Those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 96 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, 12th year next year, Proje de Loire. Resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.